Hello, I'm David Hayward, a writer and consultant in the fields of Christian ministry and ministerial formation. This video is part of a programme of online learning for all those involved in ministerial training, especially where ordinands and candidates for lay ministry are studying through a common awards programme. The purpose of the video is to introduce you to the concept of a practice as defined by Alistair McIntyre in his book After Virtue. In other units in the programme, we'll be looking at how this concept applies to the practice of Christian discipleship, Christian ministry and to the subject disciplines involved in ministerial training. I hope that by the end of this unit you will have a clear understanding of what a practice is be equipped to notice the way practices figure in all the various spheres of everyday life, and to be able to use this idea of a practice as a lens through which to understand more fully your own contribution to ministerial training. Alistair McIntyre introduces his notion of a practice in the 14th chapter of his book After Virtue. He makes it clear that he is using the word practice in a technical sense, different to its everyday usage. In the book, McIntyre sets out to reinstate the virtue tradition of ethics as an alternative to the traditions of utilitarianism and deontological thinking that originated in the Enlightenment. His argument rests on three key concepts, of which the concept of a practice is one. The others are the narrative structure of human life and the idea of a moral tradition. A practice, writes McIntyre, provides the arena in which the virtues are exercised. The value of the concept for our purposes is not connected so much with the exercise of the virtues. It lies in the fact that practices also provide the contexts in which we learn about the world and develop our identity which means that our knowledge is linked to our engagement in practices, as well as our values. So what does McIntyre mean by a practice? A practice is a coherent, complex and cooperative human activity with a defined social context and history. It has a goal recognised by those who engage in it and by the wider society in which the practice takes place. It has recognised standards of excellence which have developed over time and are capable of being extended. For something to be a practice, it has to be complex and cooperative. So kicking a ball is not a practice, but the game of football is, because it is both complex and cooperative. It has a recognised place in society, rules that have developed over time and agreed standards of excellence. We can also see that the place of football in society has changed over the years and that its standards of excellence are continually developing. In the same way, planting turnips is not a practice, but farming is a practice that is vital to human well-being. Undertaken by a community, many of whom have inherited a tradition of farming stretching back over the centuries. The example of farming also illustrates how the mutually recognised goals of a practice may change or be the subject of dispute. To produce as much food as cheaply as possible or to protect the environment. Practices are ubiquitous. They include vital activities like farming and architecture, the arts such as painting and music, games such as chess and cricket, scientific research, the nurture of family life and the exercise of political leadership. Not only are practices everywhere in society, but practices require the exercise of virtue. To be a good farmer, the farmer needs to understand crops, livestock, soils and farm machinery and exercise skills of husbandry but she also requires qualities such as patience in working with the rhythms of the climate and care for the land and the environment. Sports like cricket require a basic level of knowledge and a considerable degree of skills, but also virtues like courage, humility and sportsmanship. Scientific research requires commitment, passion and the patient search for truth. 
Academic research requires attentiveness, patience, intellectual humility and seasoned judgment. These virtues develop through participation in the practice and may be specific to the practice. They are required for such things as cooperation, the recognition of authority, respect for standards and risk taking. But McIntyre also argues that there are basic virtues such as justice, courage and honesty that are needed if we are to master any practice. McIntyre also points out that for every practice there are rewards that are external to the practice and rewards that are internal. External re rewards include the money, power and prestige that may result from success. The internal rewards are those that derive specifically from the practice itself. The joy of working with the land, the satisfaction of the musician in being part of a choir or orchestra, the intellectual satisfaction of finding a solution to a complex problem, the craftsman's satisfaction in a job well done. Crucially, we only develop the virtues required by the practice if we pursue the internal rewards. Having introduced you to the concept of a practice, the next thing you need to do is to work with that concept so that you really grasp it. You might like to pause the video and do this exercise now, or wait and do all the exercises at the end. Choose either farming, cricket, scientific research, or if you prefer some other field of human endeavour, and describe it as a practice. Identify the social context in which it takes place and the way this has changed over the years. The goals provided for the practice by its concept, context and the way these may also have changed during its history. The recognised standards of good practice and the way these have been extended. If you're following this programme with colleagues, it'll be a great advantage to do this exercise in pairs or threes. I expect that you can already see that Christian ministry is a cluster of practices, each a coherent, complex and cooperative activity, each with its agreed goals, each with its standards of excellence. Here I've illustrated preaching, pastoral care and leading worship, but they're not the only ones. Leadership of a congregation is a hugely important practice for ministry. And in his book, Church for Every Context, Michael Moyner argues that the founding and nurturing of fresh expressions of church is now a practice. In the early days, pioneer ministers used to say that they were making it up as they went along. Now, argues Moyner, there's no need for them to do that. Recognised standards of excellence have emerged over the past few years and are now widely recognised. Pioneers now form a coherent community of practice in which goals and standards are shared and discussed. The idea of communities of practice is the subject of another unit in this programme. So having seen that ministry is made up of practices, let me invite you to think about this a bit deeper. See if you can describe Anglican worship in all its variety as a practice. Think about its social contexts and the way they have changed over the years, the goals of worship and the way they are expressed. And see if you can give examples of standards of good practice and the way these have been extended over the years. If you are a teacher in ministerial formation, what about your own discipline? Can you describe it as a practice? What is its goal, its history, its standards of excellence? And have these changed over the years? And what are the virtues that you need to practice the discipline with integrity? Another feature of practices that we should note is that they're very often sustained by institutions. For example, the National Church provides training for ministers, 
Dioceses administer the care of church buildings. Expert working groups help to establish good standards for leadership and pastoral care. Academic institutions provide jobs and libraries and peer-reviewed journals help to establish and maintain academic standards. But institutions inevitably supply openings for external rewards, recognition, prestige, power over others, so that just by existing they may corrupt the practice. In academic life the examples might be commodification of qualifications, and the pressure to publish produced by the research assessment exercise. And for Christian ministry, concern to protect the reputation of the church has led to the neglect of good practice in safeguarding, while clericalism is a reflection of the presence of the institution. Finally, let's put the concept of a practice into a theological context. The idea of a practice takes for granted that people live in community. To be a practice, the activity has to be located in community. There has to be a mutually agreed goal. The relationships entailed by the practice must cohere with the wider community. Philosophically, this is a major move. It says that you cannot explain human behaviour simply by the laws of cause and effect. You have to place it in a teleological framework in which the assumption is made that people are agents with purposes. Theologically, this is equally significant. Dan Hardy and following him Stephen Pickard write about created and redeemed sociality. The church is meant to be the sphere of redeemed sociality. Reconciled to God, we are to be reconciled to one another learn to grow in love, and present an image to the world of what human community could be like. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Christ existing in the form of community. But before redeemed sociality, there was created sociality. The reason the church is to be a redeemed and loving community is that we are created in God's image as relational beings. God's creation is inherently relational and people are created as social beings. McIntyre's concept of a practice, which is to play a major role in our exploration of ministerial formation, grows out of this insight. <laughs>